This is Burlington, and here we are in the Channel 17 newsroom at the Center for Media and Democracy in Burlington, Vermont. This is our series, Nuclear Free Future Conversation. I'm your host, Margaret Harrington. And viewers, let's welcome back the women of Fairwheel, Fairwinds Energy Education. On my right is Chiho Kanako. Caroline Phillips is next. Maggie Gunderson is here. And Maggie, you're the CEO and founder of Fairwinds en Energy Education. Yes. Caroline, you're the program administrator. Yes. And Chiho, you're the very active and, and engaged <laughs> member of the board yes. of Fairwinds. Boy. So our subject is part two of Children Suffer Nuclear Impact Worldwide. And Maggie, just lead us into this conversation again. It's a continuation of all of the the facts and, and that was were brought up in on our last show. So tell us what comes to mind first for you with the impact, nuclear impact on children. Well thank you, Margaret, for having us first and, and thank you um, for looking at this subject because the media is not covering it and we appreciate you're bringing the truth forward. Thank you. Thank you. Children are much more radio sensitive than adults. And what that means is that the children are more susceptible to radiation. They uh, get ill more quickly, they absorb it more quickly in their bodies, and it, it's really a major concern. And all the standards for radiation are based upon a male of 160 pounds or more. So it, it's really a tragedy that children aren't considered how close they are to the ground where uh, the radiation is in the dirt, that they tie their shoes and often lick their fingers. And so all of that radiation is getting right inside and on the outside. Mm. Well, I can also add uh, uh, on top of the, um, the physical um, you know, impact of radiation on people, there are some social, um, you know, uh, impacts as well. And recently, I was reading news that the Fukushima Prefecture uh, gov government did um, research survey of um, evacuee families, and they said 47% uh, of responders uh, are now having two households. In other words, fathers living in some area, and maybe the same area where they used to live and whereas mother and children they live elsewhere because I think mothers for the most part their primary concern uh, is their children's health and so and fathers often feel obligated to stay and work in the same place or sometimes they feel ashamed to tell even you know, their colleagues that their wives and children are you know living elsewhere because it's considered to be counter to the recovery effort somehow dampening the spirit. And so in that way, children grow up in a society where they're getting two mixed messages. And not only that, uh, they also have family that are fractured, you know, so that they don't get to live in full uh, family lives. Yeah. And at the same time, <coughs> the Japanese government is telling people that it's okay to return to these, this area. Yes, that's again, uh, the part of the problem. They, well, on one hand, they say it is okay. And on the other hand, they are doing this crazy rush to uh, so-called decontaminate, scrape and uh, cut down trees to reduce the um, uh, radiation, so surf surface radiation level or air radiation level. So if they really say it's okay, you know, People should be just allowed to go without even doing anything, and yet the the reality is that they um, it's not it's not what they're saying and what they're, what they're doing. They're putting so much money into um, decontamination work. So how how do you supposed to feel? Is it really okay or it's not okay? Yeah. yeah. Um, and then we also <coughs> recently there's a lot of news about the. Um, the uh, radioactive uh, soil uh, waste uh, stemmed f that stemmed from Fukushima Daiichi disaster, it's all over Japan, especially in the northern part of Japan, but just really all over Japan. And um, 
They, you, you want to talk about the Fukushima school thing? Well, yeah. So in um, a Fukushima high school, they have found that it contains lots of waste that a teacher even reported saying uh, they did various tests on the soil using nonprofit groups, two nonprofit groups, one in the Fukushima prefecture and the other in Tokyo, so that they could compare for better analysis. And the results showed 27,000 to 33,000 becquerels of radioactive cesium per kilogram in the soil. Um, and the government's response is, you know, oh, yeah, you know, we're supposed to take care of radioactive waste that's above 8,000 becquerels, but, you know, we this is interim storage, we need to take care of that and put it into a permanent place. We just don't have that yet. But this is located on a high school grounds. So just to put the number in context, yeah. 8,000 becquerels uh, per kilogram, what, that, what does that mean? Well, prior to Fukushima Daiichi disaster, Japan, in Japan, um, if the soil or material contained more than 100 uh, becquerel per kilogram, it had to be contained in a barrel and stored on nuclear facility because it's considered to be nuclear waste. Mm -hmm. Now, that level of radiation, uh, radioactive material is all over in Japan. In fact, that Arnie was just sampling soil in front of the uh, ministry uh, building, I mean, of the trade building um, in Tokyo. And that was something like 4,000 or 5,000 mm -hmm. becquerel per kilo. That's 40 times higher more than higher it, than, than, than it should have been. been. Yeah. This is Arnie Gunderson, it's, the yeah. chief en engineer oh, of Fairwinds yeah. Energy Education, right. who was who made a trip to Japan recently for at least a month, right? Yeah, he and spent a month there studying the soil. Right. He he worked with scientists both in Fukushima Prefecture and in Tokyo, um, and also took samples with them. And the samples have all been sent to a lab, and Fairwinds will be issuing a, a report on that as soon as the study is completed. So what you're saying, Chiho, is that <coughs> things are getting worse and, and not better. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, s things are not getting better, for sure. And what's happening is that the um, radiation levels uh, gradually decrease naturally because um, like f cesium, um, you know, they have half-life that's... Um, but that's 300 years. Some, yeah, that's right. But some, like c cesium-134, they have shorter, like a 28, uh, no, shorter half-life. Yeah, it, it's, no. it's shorter. It has a two-year half-life, which year, would be year. 20 right. years before it's all gone. Oh, right. be, and, so, and cesium is what is found in, in food, in milk? In in our, strontium is found in milk. Okay. And cesium Iodine is found too. in meat and okay. fish, and you know it's a muscle. It it's absorbed into muscle like potassium, where strontium is absorbed into bone, um, you know, like calcium. Right. But so to, to go back to the cesium, you're saying that even though it is is less, the impact is it might be less now, but that that's a minuscule amount that is less right again in the in the big picture because right. you're giving us the big picture here of how many hundreds or thousands of years these these things remain in the soil and in the environment well so. there's there's two two things to refer to first um understanding becquerels so when we're talking about how many becquerels um Arnie was talking with us recently and he said that it's like taking a shower and having 8,000 raindrops pouring over you every minute of every day. This is the exposure they're getting or the numbers Caroline was talking about on the playground, 24,000 you yeah, said? Yeah, I think it was 27 to 33,000. 33, Backgrounds. That means that much of radiation is coming to the children playing out on that playground off of this stuff as if they were standing in radioactive rain, a radioactive shower, continuously. It, Repeatedly it, being exposed. And then Caroline has some more information to, to share about what's right. happening here in the U.S. with the EPA. 
Well, what um, Chiho was saying with in Japan, how those radiation numbers, exposure limits have changed from, I think you said, was it 100 to, to 8,000? Well, or uh, less that, that, than that, that's, that's a it's a little complicated to it talk. Complicated. I, I'm gonna I'm gonna talk about this, but okay. yeah. Well, yeah. Like in Japan, these exposure limits have changed, and they have been raised. And the EPA earlier this month in June, um, they have released a proposal to raise the limits in the United States for radiation exposure. Um, it's open for public comment until July 25th, and these exposure levels have been raised. It's you know beyond even being doubled, they're being raised 25 times more than they were. So for example, um, currently, before it's gone into action, uh, the cap of public consumption of radiation is at 4 millirems per year. With the new EPA limits, uh, 500 millirems per year for people over 15 and 100 millirems for younger children, the elderly, and pregnant or nursing women will be allowable in emergency circumstances. So that means also that if there is some sort of meltdown in the United States, the exposure limits that people will be allowed by the government to be exposed to has gone up 25 times more. And it's an interesting thing where the EPA has said it's only intended to help guide local communities and state and federal officials in the event of a disaster, and they cite for the Fukushima Daiichi meltdown, but it's something where it leaves people, especially in the immediate days following a disaster, really unprotected and exposed. Yeah, that's true. And there is no provision for what is the iodine pills that people have to take? For to, uh, well, the iodine, the potassium iodide, which allows your thyroid to absorb healthy iodine, only protects against thyroid cancer. It doesn't protect against any of the other radioactive isotopes that um, you might be inhaling or be exposed to on your skin. It, do it doesn't do anything for that. Just, it does do the thyroid and should be made available, especially for women and children. Um, but a lot of, uh, during um, the Bush presidency, the second Bush presidency, um, they took back some of the availability to potassium iodide because the industry didn't want people to be afraid. So instead of protecting people, and, and that happened also in Japan when uh, Fukushima Daiichi had its triple meltdown the bureaucracy stopped the release because they didn't have an order from above to release the um, potassium iodide and give it to people. So a lot of children are developing thyroid cancers. Yes, that's, that's to get back viewers. This is, we're talking about a raised number of, of uh, percentage of thyroid cancer in children in Japan because of the, uh, the triple meltdown. And uh, Chiho, can you, can you elaborate on that? Yes. So Fukushima Prefecture is doing a follow-up, um, you know, uh, can thyroid cancer checks uh, on children who are 18 or under at the time of disaster. And of something like 300 um, children, who th 300,000 children, um, now the latest number shows that the 172 uh, people, children, or now some uh, young adults, are now um, considered to have either have thyroid cancer or have serious, um, uh, I guess, uh, sus suspicion that they do. And 131 people have already gone through removal uh, surgery. And this is a significant number because compared to what uh, the statistics uh, was prior to Fukushima Daiichi disaster, uh, which was one or two in a million people. It's, it's a lot of number. And at, at that time, Fukushima Prefecture had the lowest rate of thyroid cancer in Japan. And, and now it has the highest rate by far. The problem is the, the experts who are tasked to analyze what this means. They keep saying, even today, they say, 
it's difficult to um, conclude that this elevated uh, statics, statistics has anything to do with radiation. And that's just patently untrue. There's nowhere in the world I except in Ch around Chernobyl has there been such a high rate of thyroid cancers. And it's definitely, you know, the iodine comes out in the early days of a nuclear meltdown or, or radiation, radiation. Radi radiation release from, from any type of uh, radioactive pipe or water, or, you know, that it comes out, it leaks out, and that attacks the thyroid right away. So this is organized denial it's of right. the effects of, of radiation. And we see it, President Obama went to Hiroshima in this historic visit recently. And let's speak, let, uh, please talk about that. Uh, what, what do we, what do we uh, take away from the fact that he did not mention radiation in Hiroshima and he didn't mention radiation, for, uh, he didn't mention the Fukushima meltdown at all? So he, there was a, just a denial of that it happened. Well, for me, um, I was terribly disappointed because he didn't apologize to the Japanese people for dropping the bomb, which State Department records show um, was done not because the war needed to be ended. It was already ending, but, but the bombs were dropped uh, to show the Russians that we could do that and we had this technology mm -hmm. and that's just a devastating devastating thing and and we should have apologized for that i believe and secondly he didn't mention anything about fukushima daiichi i believe that um, the nuclear regulatory commission and the department of energy the u.s agencies are complicit in in the cover-up in japan they have they give money to keep um, a refabrication facility open and it's our tax dollars going for that and 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 in that case almost 80 percent of the people want um, the used uh, the reprocessing facility closed and and so you look at all these things and it's just about power and money from my standpoint in the US Chiho I don't know from your standpoint in Japan um. So last year, I worked as a volunteer interpreter for the uh, A-bomb victims organization called Hidankyo, who came to UN for the uh, five-year NPT, non, uh, Nuclear Non-Proliferation uh, Treaty Review Conference. Yes. And um, so I have a slightly mm, uh, different take on that, uh, Mr. Obama's uh, visit. Um, it's good that he went. It's because it's historic um, yes. and people are genuinely touched that this happened with a sitting president. Yes. Um, so it's a start. But uh, I think they are feeling that the, um, you know, they, Mr. Obama, President Obama, uh, in, as an individual, he might be actually a more nuanced and sensitive person, and yet his position as a president of the United States, you know, he has a lot of... Um, um, limita limitations, restrictions posed on him. And so they would like to pull that human side of him more, come out to, to see, feel, um, as a as fellow human, what a horrible thing it is, the nu you know, radiation or nuclear bomb does to humans, to you know, each other. And they wanted, they wanted to sort of uh, seize on that um, individual instinct. And in this trip, that didn't quite happen. So they're hoping for maybe future, another visit by Mr. Obama. That's what oh. they're saying. And it's, I understand why uh, President Obama didn't want to go to Fukushima, I mean, talk about Fukushima, because that just opened the whole can of worms for the industry. And the uh, United States uh, government has a lot at stake also by jeopardizing the, its, you know, its uh, commercial interest in nuclear power. Right, so it's building, mm -hmm. Westinghouse is building all the new nuclear plants in, in China, and um, they're touting and marketing their things all over the world, and Japan is also. And so even while we, we see the tragedy of 
Daiichi and, and the meltdowns and what that's doing to the Japanese people, Japan is selling nuclear plants and nuclear services other places around the world like the U.S. is. And, and the nuclear industry is one of the United States' biggest exports. It's a huge moneymaker. And, it, you know, I, I just feel really strongly as a, a woman, a mother, a grandmother, that it's morally wrong. And I was in the nuclear power industry. And I promoted nuclear power plants. And I, I think they're morally wrong. Their connection to... Um, the atomic bomb and, and the way the industry is, is is just not what we should be practicing as a human race. Mm. So I'm sorry to just go back to what we were talking no, about earlier, please, please. <coughs> but I, <coughs> I promised to follow up on the uh, 8,000 yeah. thing, right? Um, so recently, um, the Ministry of Environment in Japan, they issued a new guideline um, to allow um, radioactive soil up to 8,000 becquerel per kilogram to be used in public works uh, construction. So they can be used underneath the, la you know, as a layer of road construction mm. anywhere in Japan. That, what that means, the reality is that the uh, Japan is now inundated with radioactive material that they don't, they don't know what to do with. So oh, then this is terrible because the last, at the last discussion, you said that there were these plastic bags oh, of yeah. the uh, radioactive material, and you're saying now... They're going to sift it through, and then they say, okay, well, this pile over here is just under 8,000 It's microphone. dispersed, it's okay. Yeah, and it's going to be covered with concrete or something, so it'll be okay. Mm. But, so that's what the life, I mean, situation is, and then what ha has the world... What, that's how the world has become. And it's not just in Japan, I don't think. No, actually, we were learning when we went to the uranium symposium last, year, last April, actually, in Quebec City. Um, there were houses that were built with sand from various uh, uranium mining tailings. And they had kind of done the similar method of dispersing this uranium waste. I mean, concrete, concrete floors. Concrete floors. So people's homes, their foundation of their homes were made with this concrete. And there's a frightening record in Canada of people who discover that they are living on these radioactive foundations and they have health consequences from it. Hmm. And they have no idea. You know, you have no idea that that's valid practice, apparently, according to their governments. Well, Arnie was saying that the, uh, you know, e e even in this country today, if a hundred becquerel per kilogram uh, level of soil was sitting here, it has to be put into a barrel and shipped to, what, Texas? Did you say that? Texas yeah. for Vermont, because oh, yeah. that's the... Oh, Texas yeah. from Vermont Yankee, Vermont Yankee. Yeah, well... And if we found it here in Vermont, because yeah. each state has a different repository, so there's these highly radioactive sites of waste all around the country, and most of them are leaking. Um, Dr. Marco Kaltofen, who we work with at Worcester Polytechnic Institute in Massachusetts, he's doing several studies at several of the waste sites, and the exposure to the workers and what's leaking off into nearby rivers and and what's moving towards precious aquifers is terrifying especially in new mexico right in the uh, epa announcements of raising their radiation exposure that's really rough for places like new mexico who have a lot of um, nuclear waste storage facilities and they're located shockingly close to aquifers and, of course, in New Mexico, that is precious, right. precious right. resources. 
And, and that goes back to the uranium mining also, right, right, right. which, which thre of course, impacted the aquifers too. Right, right. And, and the people's health. Right. But it, meanwhile, what studies are being done? That, what official studies are being done by governments? The about U.S. Ha has blocked any official studies, and the NIH was, was doing one on radiation exposures and uh, in conjunction with the NRC. And the NRC has said that it doesn't have the money to continue the study, so they've shut it down. They're shutting it down. But they never wanted to do it to begin with. The industry has refused in the U.S., where in Germany they did have studies done. Concentric circles around all the operating nuclear plants showed extensive leukemias. And, and right here in Vermont, I heard the founder of that study speak at University of Vermont Med Center. And, and give lectures and, and had the doctors were there and, and asking questions and it was amazing what they found and what they uncovered and this country had, re had sponsored the study because they thought that it would show that the, the industry was fine and it's fine to keep operating these nuclear plants. Every operating nuclear plant releases radiation into the environment that we all breathe in or contaminates water and soil nearby and, and we eat it or drink it. And the industry has wanted to prove that it's okay. So in Germany, that's what they did and it proved it's not okay. And here in the U.S., they refused to complete the study. And I remember that was Dr. Eisenberg who was on right. this program several years ago. And what impact did it have on the German nuclear industry? I think that it really, behind the scenes, helped color um, Chancellor Merkel's um, viewpoint. She is a physicist. She was originally very pro-nuclear. She knew all that data. She was familiar with it. And then the meltdowns happened in Japan. And Germany made the decision to begin shutting all their reactors down. And they've done a phenomenal job converting to solar and wind and their solar they they're they're financing solar on rooftops all over and germany is is not a really sunny country you know and they're getting phenomenal there were there was a whole 16 hour time period that they ran solely the whole country on solar so, so this is one very good example of how education and studies can turn Right. the story around, right? right? right. But this is the story, I mean, the, the impact of nuclear on people, and especially, as we're speaking here, on children. So, right. Mm. Well, I side with the uh, mother's uh, instincts um, over what the society um, puts, you know, priority on. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, because uh, mothers say what's good for the health of children which is the future of our species basically I mean not mm -hmm. just society mm -hmm. and um, we need to heed their um, right. voice. Their impulse. Yeah. yeah we got a call actually on Monday of this week maybe it was Tuesday from a concerned mother in British Columbia her child was is attending elementary school. She didn't say how, what grade, but in their elementary school, they're being taught um, the benefits of nuclear power. And she was upset, and so she contacted Fairwinds Energy Education to ask if we had something for elementary-aged students, which is something we were working on and we'd like to do. And so. Her concern was, she said, you know, I'm, as a mother, I want to go to my school and I want to give them other material to talk about for our children to say, you know, we need to help end climate change, but nuclear is not the only option. It's not the one we need to be teaching our kids. We have these other resources. And her concern was so passionate and she just she sees this as this next generation of children are they need to know and be educated that there are other paths and she was just so devastated that that was starting at such an early age and that was something that they weren't 
providing alternatives to. Mm -hmm. right. You're saying that it, it is part of the syllabus. It yes. is. It this is, is uh, the it Nuclear is. Energy yeah. Institute, it the is. lobbying arm here in the U.S. of the nuclear industry ha prepares all the materials and it's used in the curriculum in all the public schools that want to access it from K through twel grade 12. Mm -hmm. And even in colleges, it's their curriculum that trains nuclear engineers and nuclear operators. So it's very in a box, one-sided, very pro-nuke. They don't know how to look at things in any other way. So we have denial, we have misinformation. Yes. And we have a downright uh, propagation of lies about okay. this industry. And right before us, as, as you are showing us and our viewers, this is going. This is every day. The people in Japan, in in uh, in Ukraine, in Chernobyl, are facing this, and for generations. Mm -hmm. So Caroline uncovered some things in Chernobyl about um, the lunch program mm -hmm. that that we had discussed last time, and the lunch program is one where the only food the children received that was not contaminated was from the government and these government subsidies for lunch programs they were cut off they're in an economic state where they can't well at least they choose no longer to provide those school lunches and so mothers are forced to feed their children farmed food from their surrounding area and they live in the area outside of Chernobyl that was kind of that gray area of evacuation where it was like, okay, we're not going to evacuate you, but we'll provide you with government subsidies that they're no longer providing. And it is affecting the food that the children are eating. And so now they're forced to eat food that is radioactive, is radioactive, radioactive milk, radioactive, radioactive berries. berries. Um, vegetables that are grown in the radioactive zone. That's and the mothers know and they're devastated by it, but there's nothing, it's that or starvation for these children because they don't have food. And people who are poor yeah. um, and marginalized, they're the ones who, are, you know, who suffer most. The most. Yeah, because it's they don't have alternatives. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, the last time we, you ended the program with me, uh, Chiho, you said, isn't it okay to say we don't want this? <laughs> and I think that let's, let's end it again like that and with each of you saying we don't want this and, and in, in your own words. So, Maggie, do you want to start? It? I think that that's the main reason that I founded Fairwinds and Arnie and I continue to do this work is we want the truth out and we want to protect um, the families around the world. You know, it's, it's pretty simple. Yeah, we don't want our government to enforce exposures on us or, or lead us to believe that these exposures are okay. With the new EPA exposure limits that they're proposing, it's the equivalent of 250 x-rays a year that you don't need. I don't want that in my body. We don't want this. Mm. No. Well, it's a larger p problem, I guess. It's not just about nuclear uh, industry, but it just uh, concerns other things, like GMO and chemicals. And but it's usually problems usually are created over there at the top, and you know, people who have a lot of power and money, and people who suffer are the people like us on on the periphery, mm -hmm. and. Um, I think uh, small people's voices need to be stronger. Yes. I don't know. Uh, maybe it's too optimistic for me to say that, though. Mm. I don't but know. by you saying it, there's optimism, there's action. There's action in your voice. And viewers, we listen to the women of Fairwinds, and uh, we, we will come back to you again to be, to, for more education. Thank you. And enlightenment. Thank you, Mark. Thank you very much for coming again. Thank you, viewers, You're for watching. You're welcome. Goodbye for now.